And the answer is I'm right and they're wrong. The idea of diversification makes sense to a point. If you don't know what you're doing and you want the standard result and not be embarrassed, well, of course, you can widely diversify. Nobody's entitled to a lot of money for recognizing that because it's a truism. It's like knowing that two and two equals four. But the investment professionals think they're helping you by arranging a dur dur diversification. An idiot could diversify a portfolio or a computer for that matter. But the whole trick of the game is to have, have a few times when you know that something is better than average and uh, invest only where you have that extra knowledge. And then if you get just a few opportunities, that's enough. Now, what the hell does you care? You own three securities and JP Morgan Chase owns a hundred. What's wrong with owning a few securities? Warren always says if you lived in a growing town and you owned stock in three of the best enterprises in the town, isn't that diversified enough? The answer is, of course it is. They're all wonderful places. And that fortunes formula, which got so famous, which was a formula to tell people how much to bet on each transaction if you had a, an edge. And of course, the bigger your edge, the more close the transaction was to a certain winner, the more you should bet. And of course, there's mathematics behind it. But of course, it's true. It's perfectly possible to buy, buy only one thing because the opportunity is so great and such a cinch, or only two or three. So the whole idea of diversification when you're looking for excellence is totally ridiculous. It doesn't work. It gives you an impossible task. What fun is it to do an impossible task over and over again? I find it agony. I just, who would want to do it? And I don't see why. My father had a client. He was a lawyer in Omaha. He had a client whose husband had a little soap company. And the guy died and my father sold the soap company. This woman was one of the richest people in town in the middle of the Depression. And what she had was a little soap company in a Bayless mansion in Omaha's best neighborhood. And they sold the soap company. She had a mansion in the best neighborhood and $300,000. But $300,000 in 1930 something was an incredible amount of money. A little hamburger was a nickel, a big hamburger was a dime, and the all you can eat cafe in Omaha would, would feed you all you needed to stay alive for two bits a day. I mean, 300000 well, she didn't hire an investment counselor. She didn't do anything. She's a wonderful old woman. And she just took that and she divided it into five chunks. And she bought five stocks. I remember three of them because I probated her estate. And it was one of them was General Electric, one was Dow, one was DuPont, and I forget the other two. And then she never changed those stocks. She never paid any advisor. She never did anything. And she bought some municipal bonds. She never spent her income. And she bought some missile bonds from time to time. By the time she died in the 50s, she had a million and a half dollars. No costs, no expenses. And I said, how did you decide to do that? And she said, well, she said, I thought electricity and chemistry were the coming things. We just chunked it all in and sat on her ass. <laughs> I always liked that little woman. <laughs> My kind of a girl. <laughs> and... But it's, it's rare, you know, it's, but if you stop to think about it, think of all the expense and palaver that she didn't have to listen to and all the trouble she avoided and zero costs. And of course, what people don't realize because they're so mathematically illiterate is that if you make 5% and pay two of it to your advisors, you're not losing 40% of your future. You're losing 90%. Because over a long period of time, that little difference causes a 90% disadvantage to you. So it's hugely important for somebody who's a long-term holder not to be paying a big annual toll out of the performance. And of course, there are a few big-time advisors now who are using indexation very heavily. And of course, they're prospering mightily. And of course, every time they get somebody, it's just agony for the rest of the investment counseling business. And... This is a very serious problem. And I think these people who are used to winning as old time value investors who are now just quitting the profession, that's a very understandable thing to do. I, I, I regard it as more noble than staying in 
playing along with the denial. It's an interesting problem. I, you can see I'm trying not trying to make your morning. <laughs> I'm just trying to describe things the way they are.